as we all know, these two articles, articles 12 and 13, are the first two provisions in part three of the constitution. And as such, in many ways, they form the backbone of what we can regard generally as India's Bill of Rights. Now, ordinarily, when we discuss a jurisprudence of rights, there are a few broad questions that we must address before we consider the substantive contents of the various promises that are made and the remedies that one is entitled to in the event of a violation of a right. Now, the question is, what are these sort of preliminary issues that we must go over? The first question concerns the persons who are entitled to claim protection under the enumerated rights. Are corporations, for example, entitled to a guarantee of fundamental rights? Can animals and other sentient beings claim protection? And so forth. The second question is one which is concerned with the persons against whom the rights are enforceable. For example, can fundamental rights be enforced against purely private entities, such as corporations? Can rights be enforced against societies and trusts? What about religious organizations? Can rights be enforced against such bodies? The third question deals with the nature of actions that face scrutiny under part three. That is what kinds of actions by bodies bound by fundamental rights are amenable to challenge. The fourth question concerns the consequences. What happens to a law that is found to violate a fundamental right? Now, for the purposes of our discussion today, we will not concern ourselves much over the first of these questions, that is that the actors who are entitled to protection. Because this is largely guided by each fundamental right and it differs from one right to another. We'll possibly touch upon some of these over the course of the discussion, but we won't place too much emphasis on. But we will look at questions two, three and four in the specific contexts of articles 12 and 13. We will, of course, also see that these questions, independent of the Constitution's text and language, is capable of producing a number of jurisprudential quandaries. But in answering these questions, we'll try and guide ourselves predominantly by what the text of the Constitution says and the history that went into its making. Now, we can begin the discussion for today with Article 12 of the Constitution. What Article 12 says, and I quote, is that in this part, unless the context otherwise requires, the state includes the government and parliament of India and the government and legislature of each of the states and all local or other authorities within the territory of India or under the control of the government of India. Now, when we read this provision, there are a number of facets that are immediately apparent. First, we can see that the definition of state that the article stipulates is applicable generally only to part three, that is to the fundamental rights chapter. Second, it is evident that the definition is inclusive in nature. The article itself uses the word includes. Third, it appears that these organs that are included in the definition are by and large organs concerning governmental operations. Fourth, while some of these organs have been specifically spelled out, the definition also uses the term other authorities that are either within India or under the control of the government of India. Now, in so far as the specifically spelled out categories are concerned, there has been very little in the way of controversy. It is clear, for example, that parliament and the state legislatures are state within the definition of Article 12. It is also clear, for example, that a municipal corporation, which operates under the control of a government, such as the Corporation of Chennai, for example, would constitute state within Article 12. These organs, therefore, are necessarily bound by the various rigors that are imposed by the Fundamental Rights Chapter. 
the real controversy has arisen over the use of the term other authorities now article 12 does not clearly state what these other authorities might be except to stipulate that the term includes authorities both within the territory of india and under the control of the government of india the term or that is used here in article 12 is quite clearly disjunctive in nature now one of the major sources of debate that the court has grappled with over the years is the use of the doctrine of ejusdem generis to construe the term other authorities ejusdem generis as we all know is latin for of the same kind so when a law lists a classes of persons or things this concept of ejusdem generis is generally used to clarify the meaning of such a list now we can take an example to try and understand this i borrow this example from the us supreme court uh, judgment in mcboyle versus us a 1931 judgment where the court was concerned with a law which referred to automobiles trucks tractors motorcycles and other motor powered vehicles and the court was called upon to interpret what this other motor powered vehicles might be the court used the doctrine of ejusdem to hold that these other powered vehicles would not include aeroplanes for example because the exceeded this included only land based transportation now in the common law this principle of ejusdem generis has generally been used as a canon to construct the terms of contractual agreements in this article therefore one of the arguments that has been made for the years is that the term authorities must be interpreted in light of the terms that preceded and must therefore only refer to entities that are state like in nature case the argument goes is supported by the fact that generally a bill of rights and generally the broad realm of public law governs a vertical relationship between the state and the citizen private law on the other hand governs relationship inter se between individuals groups and companies but why is this the case why is it that a bill of rights and the realm of public law generally governs a relationship between the state and the citizen to answer that we need to look not only at the text of our constitution and the history of its making but we should also understand how the idea of public law and enforceable rights really came about now there are three big historical events that gave rise to the birth of the bill of rights in its modern form these are the glorious revolution in england in uh, 1689 the american revolution in 1776 and the french revolution in 1789 all of these revolutions were largely engineered by the bourgeois class of the time against increasing incursions that were being made into the existing feudal economy now since the chief threat to the economy as it existed at the time came from the government and from the state the language of the bill of rights that emanated out of these revolutions reflected that concern therefore the main function of having a bill of rights was to stop the state from interfering in the freedom of trade and in the ability of the bourgeois class to go about their daily business in whatever manner and fashion that they deemed fit this idea of a limited government which we've heard quite a bit of in recent times now for example the early american mistrust of government power came from colonial experience a number of historians attribute the enacting of the stamp act by the english parliament in 1765 as birthing the bill of rights in america now there was a resentment in america amongst the bourgeois classes of any taxes that were imposed and and taxes in in, in that at that time were imposed on every legal and business document even books and newspapers were taxed so the early conception of rights around the western world in particular was predicated on an idea of what we regard as classical liberalism 
that is, which were based on concepts of classical economics, free trade and business, a laissez-faire government with minimal intervention and minimal taxation, trying to have a balanced budget and so forth. Over time, though, as the conception of Bill of Rights broadened, and as we saw the state taking over more and more important public functions, and as we saw economies around the move, world move from a laissez-faire government to the welfare state, such as we have in India, for example, it has become important to hold the state responsible also for the public goods that it was obligated to provide. This also meant that when the state outsourced some of these duties, those bodies to whom it outsourced those duties ought to also be made responsible for the provision of those public goods. So when the Supreme Court had to consider the meaning of the phrase other authorities in Article 12, it had to keep in mind this history and this general philosophical foundation for the Bill of Rights. Now let's take a hypothetical, but not even, near, not even hypothetical so much, but a recent example to try and frame this controversy before we get into how the Supreme Court has over the years interpreted the phrase other authorities in Article 12. In the recently introduced fourth tranche of measures that were announced by the finance minister in response to the ongoing pandemic, a series of announcements were made and these concerned the easing of limits on foreign direct investment in the defense sector, the privatization of a number of airports, the opening up of airspace to private operators, allowing the private sector greater participation in the mining of coal and other minerals, and so forth. Now we'll see that when these plans fructify, should they fructify, what we might well see is far greater private participation in what are essentially public functions. There might well come a time soon when the airspaces become wholly the realm of private entities. The question is, should such entities be altogether immune from the guarantee of fundamental rights made in part three of the constitution? Now, when we get to the cases, we'll see that even as early as in the first big constitutional case that the Supreme Court heard in AK Gopalan was a state of Madras, AR 1950, Supreme Court 27. Justice Patanjali Shastri, in one of his opinions, in one of the opinions that was rendered by the court, made it clear that there is a general rule that the protection of Article 21, which was at stake in the case before the court, was designed to afford protection against the state and not against private individuals. Justice Shastri therefore said, that when an individual is hurt by another individual, for example, if he were to be assaulted on the road by, in, by some other person, then the ordinary remedy for such a person lies in invoking the ordinary criminal law by filing a complaint with the police. They cannot invoke directly the writ jurisdiction of the Supreme Court under Article 32 because fundamental rights, especially the fundamental right under Article 21, is enforceable only against the state. Now, this principle was once again reiterated by Chief Justice Patanjali Shastri, as he then was, in P.D. Shamdasani versus Central Bank of India, AR 1952, Supreme Court 59. The issue there, this was a judgment of a constitution bench again, as most judgments at the time were. The issue there concerned a sale of about five shares made by the bank in purported exercise of its right of lien for recovery of a debt that was due to it from the petition. The petitioner before the Supreme Court contended that his right under Article 19 f which was still present in, the, uh, in Part 3 of the Constitution at the time, to acquire, hold, and dispose of property, was violated. The Supreme Court said that the petitioner was wholly unjustified in invoking Article 32 and in invoking the court's writ jurisdiction because the rights under 19 f and 31 were constitutional safeguards against state aggression on private property and any infringement by private individuals should be sought in the ordinary law. Now, while these are important denunciations of the law, they were hardly controversial in nature. The real controversy concerned how the term other authorities was interpreted. And the development of the law on this can be traced through six main judgments of the Supreme Court. The first judgment came up in 1967 in Rajasthan State Electricity Board versus Mohanlal. 
Now, the Rajasthan State Electricity Board was a body corporate. It was constituted under the Electricity Supply Act of 1948. Before the board was constituted, the government was supplying electricity through its own departments. This case, the facts of the case involved a dispute between workmen and the corporation concerning promotion of some of these workmen. The workmen claimed that the actions of the corporation violated a number of their fundamental rights and among others, articles 14 and 16. The court was called upon to first decide whether this Rajasthan State Electricity Board was an other authority under article 12. The respondent before the court, or rather the Rajasthan State Electricity Board, argued, relying on a number of different judgments of various high courts, that the principle of adjustum generis should be adopted. And in applying the principle, the electricity board cannot be considered state under Article 12. It relied, for example, on a judgment of the Madras High Court in University of Madras versus Shantabai, AR 1954. Madras 67, where the Madras High Court had held that a university would not be state within the meaning of 12, since the phrase other authorities could only refer to authorities that were exercising governmental functions. Similar judgments had been issued by the Punjab and Haryana High Court, by the Mysore High Court, etc., all of which had held universities not to be state. The Supreme Court, however, rejected this argument and held that the High Courts had committed an error in applying the principle of adjustum generis. The court said that to invoke this principle, there must in the first place be a distinct genus or category that ran through the bodies that were already named. According to the Supreme Court, there was no common genus that ran through the terms that were contained in Article 12. And since no such common genus was present, the electricity board, it said, would fall within the definition of state. What the court also did was it relied on the dictionary meaning of the word authority. Authority, the court said, means a public administrative agency or corporation possessing quasi governmental powers and which was authorized to administer a revenue producing public enterprise. This dictionary meaning, the court said, was wide enough to include all bodies created by a statute on which powers were conferred to carry out governmental or quasi-governmental functions. What is more, the phrase the court said was wide enough to include within it every authority that was created by a statute and that was functioning within the territory of India or under the control of the government. Broadly, therefore, the court had held that any entity which is invested with statutory power and which is a creature of a statute would be state within Article 12. Now, to the court, it didn't matter whether the body concerned was performing a purely commercial role or whether it was invested with responsibilities that were public in nature. Now, this opinion of the court, that of the majority, was rendered by Justice Bhargava. Justice J.C. Shah wrote a concurring opinion, and it's an interesting concurring opinion. He agreed with the final opinion that was rendered by the court, but he gave different reasons for why the electricity board would fall within the meaning of Article 12. According to Justice Shah, Article 12 had to be interpreted in the context of the specific chapter in which it had found itself. He felt that any authority which was vested with a kind of power in exercise of which it could seriously impinge on a fundamental right ought to be considered as state under Article 12. To him, it didn't matter that the board was a creature of a statute. What mattered to him was that the board was invested with sovereign powers. This could have been through statute or, the, or this could have even been through a complete abandonment of state power. He saw that the board had the power to promote a coordinated development of electricity, to promote generation, supply and distribution of electricity, it even had the power to amend, alter, and carry out schemes under the Electricity Supply Act. Therefore, it was exercising, in his belief, a sovereign function. Now, we can see these two opinions. They really reflect two different strands, two divergent philosophical schools. The first school, that of Justice Bhargava, concentrates more on the structure of the organization in question, in terms of whether it is directly or even indirectly under the control of the government of India, by virtue of it being a creature of a statute. 
the second school places greater emphasis on the function of the organization in doing so what it does is it concentrates on how an organization's activities might trench upon a person's fundamental rights now from rajasthan state electricity board we move to the next significant case which is sukhdev singh versus bhagat ram ar 1975 supreme court 1331 the question in sukhdev singh arose out of a dismissal from service of employees from three different companies this these were the oil and natural gas commission the life insurance corporation and the industrial finance corporation now each of these entities was a creature of a statute so it was really quite easy or ought to have been easy enough at any rate for the majority to simply adopt the view of justice bhargava in the rajasthan state uh, state electricity board case and really that is precisely what chief justice ray who wrote the majority verdict in sukhdev singh did he found that these bodies were capable of framing rules and regulations that had the distinct characteristic of a law these rules and regulations according to him were effectively in the nature of a delegated legislation because the power to frame these rules were themselves derived out of statutory law but there's an interesting distinction that chief justice ray drew between an ordinary body corporate and a body corporate such as the three companies that were before him which were all creatures of statutes a gen generally a company he said was not a statutory body because it was not created by a statute but it was merely incorporated in accordance with the provisions of a statute in this case the companies act but ongc lic and the industrial finance corporation on the other hand they were all creatures of a statute so this was chief justice ray's opinion for the majority the concurring opinion a concurring opinion in the case was delivered by justice matthew and this is of far greater importance because he took the test forward and it was this test that would ultimately be adopted in ajay hasya's case which we'll see later but unfortunately justice matthew's judgment although it is rich in its jurisprudential and historical study the ultimate conclusion that he rendered remained somewhat vague and indecipherable because on the one hand justice matthew recognized that the concept of state itself had evolved incredibly over time and the state could not no longer simply be looked upon as to borrow his words a coercive machinery wielding the thunderbolt of authority because he felt that the idea the essential problem of liberty and equality is one of freedom from arbitrary restriction and discrimination and that arbitrariness could stem from all kinds of different people in positions of power when you read some of the when you read some of the opening paragraphs of justice matthew's opinion it's possible for us to be mistaken in thinking that he was in the process of evolving a wide definition of the term state but what he wound up doing instead was to vacillate between the two approaches that we saw in the rajasthan state electricity board case between the strict legal approach of the majority of justice bhargava's opinion and the more functional approach adopted by justice shah finally though and quite tellingly what justice matthew held was that the ultimate question was whether a corporation is an agency or instrumentality of the government for carrying on a business for the benefit of the public without prescribing a clear test he had said that some of these considerations that could be taken into account in determining whether an entity was an agency or instrumentality was to find out whether the state was providing financial support to the organization whether it was exercising an unusual degree of control over its management and policies whether it was performing an important public function and so forth but clarity somehow wasn't quite forthcoming from either of these two judgments a bit more of that came from the next judgment which we'll see which is rd shetty versus international airport authority ar 1979 supreme court 1628 which is a judgment of a three judge bench the international airport authority was a body corporate that was created under the international airport authority act of 1971 in this case the authority had issued a notice inviting tenders for running a restaurant and two snack bars in the bombay high, uh, airport for a period of 3 years 
the person who made the highest bid eventually was the successful bidder but some of the other bidders had contended before the court that some of the stipulations contained in the notice by the airport authority was not followed and therefore their rights under article 14 was violated in answering these questions the court had to first decide whether the international airport authority was an other authority and therefore state under article 12 justice bhagwati wrote the opinion for the case what he did was he adopted justice matthews doctrine of agency and state instrumentality but once again what we see is that it you know in fact justice bhagwati recognizes it himself is the difficulty in evolving a clear and specific bright line rule justice bhagwati said that there could be no cut and dried formula he uh, said that the analogy of the us was worth exploring because he noted that in the united states extensive and unusual financial assistance from the government is often an important consideration so to our an unusual degree of state control over policies and management of a corporation etc but both of these tests of financial control and control over policies and management they largely belong to the strict legalistic approach considered by the majority in rajasthan state electricity board what is important in justice bhagwati's opinion in this case was that he also held that another factor which may be regarded as having a bearing on the issue was whether the operation of the corporation is an important public function to that end what justice bhagwati recognized was that the modern state it operates a multitude of public enterprises and when those enterprises perform public functions which are closely related to governmental functions that should be considered as an important factor in deciding whether an authority was state or not now he also sought reliance on the us judgment in marsh versus alabama where the petitioner who was a jehovah's witness had been denied her first amendment rights of preaching on the sidewalks of the town by a private because the town itself was privately owned so the court there said that the privately owned town is also effectively in the nature of state and therefore those rights stood violated but what we had after rd shetty was therefore some sort of a composite test which took into account justice matthews instrumentality conception but that also took into account both the strict legal and functional approaches of justices bargava and shah in the rajasthan state electricity board yet we are still you know grappling and searching for clarity because this test of public function is in many ways quite dis descriptive because you know we justice bhagwati says yes the modern state operates a number of corporations discharges a number of functions but it isn't still particularly helpful because we still need a clear test to figure out when exactly the court can hold an organization that operates purportedly public functions to be state so from rd shetty we moved to ajay hasia versus khalid majid now this was a judgment of a constitution bench which was also authored by justice bhagwati the question here was whether the regional engineering college of shri srinagar was state under article 12 the college had been established and administered by a society which was registered under the jammu and kashmir societies registration act now if you recall chief justice raised distinction between a company that is a creature of a statute and a company that is incorporated under the companies act something similar could have been applied here and uh, the court could have well held that the rdc srinagar was not state under article 12 because it was not a creature of a statute in as much as it was merely incorporated or registered under the society's registration act but justice bhagwati adopted a far more a far wider approach because he said that you need to look beyond the veil of the corporation this is almost sort of similar to the lifting of the corporate veil approach that we see in company law it's all like a principle of juristic veil almost because he recognized there that the government could well assign a number of corporations to take care of important public functions such as post telegraph radio telephone so forth all of this could simply be assigned to private corporations and people's fundamental rights could be placed at, at the mercy of these corporations so therefore he said he introduced this principle of juristic veil where he said you could look beyond the veil of a corporate personality to see where the control really vested now in thus enunciating the principle he came up with a set of six tests which emanated according to him out of the judgment in rd shetty which was first whether an analysis 
uh, conduct an analysis of whether the government holds the corporation's entire share capital. Second, whether the government extended extensive financial assistance to the corporation. Third, whether there was a state conferred monopoly on the corporation. Fourth, whether the government exercised deep and pervasive state control over the corporation. Fifth, the whether the corporation performed functions of public importance. And sixth, whether an important governmental department had been transferred to the corporation. So these were the six tests that he laid down. But what we see in the factual analysis that he broadly relied on the extent of control that the government exercised over the corporation. He examined in this case, the composition of the society, its board of governors, its finances, its administration and so forth. And he concluded that the control of the state and the central government was very deep and pervasive. So the REC was therefore undeniably an instrumentality and agency of the state under article 12. But here was a college that was imparting public education. But that was conspicuously missing from Justice Bhagwati's analysis. Did this therefore mean that the functional test, which he himself mentions as one of the tests out of the six, was discarded? And that's the question that was answered in the judgments that followed Ajay Hasya. The first judgment, that big judgment really, that followed it, is Pradeep Kumar Biswas versus Indian Institute of Chemical Biology, 2002. 5 SCC 111, which was a judgment of a seven judge bench. The bench had been constituted to reconsider the Supreme Court's verdict in the Sabajit Tiwari case and consider whether the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research was state or not within the meaning of Article 12. Justice Ruma Pal wrote the judgment for the court. She relied on the judgment in Ajay Hasya, but she said that these tests that were laid down by Justice Bhagwati were not rigid principles. Merely because a corporation fell into one of them or an entity fell into one of them, it doesn't ex hypothesis follow that that entity would be state within Article 12. The question she said in each case was whether in light of the cumulative facts, the body in question is financially, functionally and administratively dominated by or under the control of the government. So what happens here is that the functioning itself of the body is discarded. The court isn't any longer looking into whether the body performs a public function, but rather whether the body's functioning is under the control of the government. And this <clears> is a <throat> critical distinction. Now, any doubts that might have lingered on on whether the public function test which Justice Bhagwati at least invoked still remained was put to rest by the Supreme Court in the last of the judgments that we, we are considering, which is Z Telefilms versus Union of India, 2005, 4 SCC, 649. The question here was whether the Board of Control for Cricket in India was state or not within Article 12. The BCCI argued that it was an autonomous body, that it was a society registered under the Tamil Nadu Societies Registration Act. There was no deep and pervasive control exercised by the government over it, and therefore it was not state. Z Telefilms, the petitioner, argued that the, gov that the board performed important governmental functions in the area of cricket. It had a virtual state conferred monopoly and therefore it was state. The court ruled in favor of BCCI. The BCCI, it said, was not a creature of statute. The government did not have any share capital in it. It didn't provide any explicit financial control or assistance. It didn't confer explicit monopoly. It did not exercise any pervasive control over it and it had not transferred a government department to the BCCI. Therefore, according to the court, Article 12 was not applicable. The and uh, the petitioners, in, in response to the petitioners' contention that a public duty was being performed, the court said that even assuming some public duty was involved in the discharge of the board, there is no pervasive and deep control by the government over it. Therefore, that public duty to that extent that the board performs would not be sufficient to bring it within the realm of state under Article 12. Now, one can argue over whether the BCCI in fact performs a public function or not. That's something that is capable of being argued from both ends and powerful arguments can be made from both ends. The question though is one of the legal and legal doctrine involved. Should the performance of, a fun of the functioning of an entity be kept entirely out of the analysis in determining whether an entity is state or not? Should it not in certain cases, the functioning of a body 
the, that is the function that a body performs by itself confer on it the characteristic of state. These are the questions that we must be concerned with. Because imagine a scenario tomorrow, and this is not widely impossible by any means, where a slew of publicly important activities are privatized. Defense, which is already appears to be on the horizon, waterways, airways, prisons, as is the case in the United States, for example. What then happens? There might well come a time when the state performs a purely performative role. The problem is that with the judgments in Pradeep Kumar Biswas and Z Telefilms, the test today is one of pervasive government control. The public function test has been rendered virtually irrelevant. In Z, the court says that if a public function is involved, you can invoke the writ jurisdiction of the high courts under 226. But again, this will, going by the text of the constitution, be restricted only to a violation of statutory rights or other constitutional rights, which are not in the character of fundamental rights. Because remember, the definition of state in Article 12 is restricted to Part 3. But the fact remains that there are numerous bodies that perform important public functions, which effectively substitute the state as it was at the time when the constitution was conceived. So, and all of these bodies are capable of having an intense and deleterious impact on our fundamental rights. Uh, one of the approaches and uh, the constitutional scholar Gautam Bhatia, he points to two judgments which might be useful in trying to solve this quandary. One, is the judgment of Justice Mohan in Unikrishnan's case. I just mentioned these two judgments before I moved to Article 13, where in Unikrishnan's case, the question was whether private educational institutions were bound by Article 14. Justice Mohan holds there that the nature of functions discharged by these institutions are by themselves, in dis are by themselves a discharge of a public duty. So if a student is desirous, for example, of pursuing a degree in medicine, she will necessarily have to route that desire through a medical college. So these medical colleges, he said, were the instruments through which the students can attain their qualification. And therefore, they perform a public duty and they're mandated to act fairly. The second judgment is the judgment in Z Telefilms itself, which as we saw says that Article 26 is possibly an avenue. But if we are to say that high courts can enforce fundamental rights against non-state bodies in a given case, these interpretive problems remain. Article 14, for example, expressly places a burden only on the state. So how do we overcome this problem? One option is to allow high courts to enforce not only statutory rights, but also common law rights that are enforceable against public bodies. Because when Justice Mohan speaks about bodies performing a public function, having a duty to act fairly in adhering to principles of natural justice, for example, that duty essentially emanates out of common law. So that is one potential solution that is available. In fact, uh, uh, Justice M. N. Venkita Chalaya, who is chairperson of the National Commission for the Review of the Working of the Constitution, he had suggested the addition, or the commission rather had suggested the addition of an explanation to Article 12 to include, to say that in the, the expression other authorities will include any person in relation to such of its functions which are of a public nature. But of course, we haven't yet gotten down to amending that portion of the article. But how the courts overcome these challenges as we potentially enter a new era of post-liberalization India, I think might represent one of the more fascinating areas of constitutional law. I'm not getting into the issue of whether judiciary is state or not in the interest of time. Uh, I'll just move over to Article 13. I've already taken quite a bit of time. Uh, I'm not reading out what artic Article 13 says, but we know that there are a few broad principles that emanate out of Article 13. First, we know that pre-constitutional laws that are in derogation of fundamental rights are void. Remember, Article 372 expressly saves pre-constitutional laws and deems them to be in force even after the constitution's adoption. So therefore, the Article 13, one says that pre-constitutional laws, which are in derogation of fundamental rights, to the extent of that derogation is void. Second, it makes it clear that the state, and this includes all the author uh, authorities that we saw in Article 12, cannot make laws that are in derogation of fundamental rights. Third, it defines what a law is. But in many ways, this is somewhat normative in nature because it defines law as anything that has the force of law. So we still have to construe what a law really is. So that this is up for interpretation in many ways, even though it provides an inclusive definition of what a law is.
And fourth, this was a principle that was brought in through constitutional amendment, the 24th constitutional amendment following the judgment in Golaknath's case, which is to say that law in Article 13 will not include a constitutional amendment. We won't have time to go over that controversy today because that will involve looking at the basic structure doctrine, which might be subject for a specific, for a separate talk altogether. Now, from these principles and from the wordings of Article 13, there are some things that are beyond any pale of controversy. A legislation made by parliament, for example, a legislation made by the state legislatures, a notification, an order, a bylaw, even a press release that is released, for example, by the RBI, which might have the force of law, which carries sanctions. All of these are amenable to fundamental rights. But perhaps a pure intergovernmental circular, which carries with it no binding sanction, that might not be law. Now, before I get into the definition of law, though, I quickly want to say a few things about other aspects of Article 13. Now, although Article 13 says that a law that violates a fundamental right will be void, there's a presumption that operates in terms of constitutionality of a statute. The, this presumption, though, doesn't apply insofar as pre-constitutional laws are concerned, or at least we can make the argument today that it doesn't apply insofar as pre-constitutional laws are concerned. The court had already mooted this idea way back in Anwar Ali Sarkar's case and subsequently in Anuj Garg's case as well. And the Delhi High Court in Naz Foundation, which when it struck down Section 377 through the opinions of uh, Justice A.P. Shah and Justice Murlidhar, expressly held that a presumption did not operate in so far as pre-constitutional laws are concerned. But as we know, this judgment was reversed by the Supreme Court first in Suresh Kumar Kaushal, where the court said the presumption will operate. But ultimately, in Navtej Johar, which overruled Kaushal, Justice Nariman in particular held that a presumption of constitutionality does not operate for pre-constitutional laws. The second issue concerns severability. On this, the text of Article 13 is itself quite clear. It says that a law will be void to the extent of its inconsistency with a fundamental right. Therefore, unless the offending provision cannot be severed from the rest of the enactment, then it is only the offending provision which will be rendered void. The classic case on severability is RMD Chamarbogwala versus Union of India, AR 1957, Supreme Court 628. Here, the court held that a number of factors need to be taken into account in determining whether an offending clause is severable or not. Legislature's intent, the semantic structure of the law, the scheme of the statute, the effect of the truncation, and so forth. Now, one thing which you just have to keep in mind in, in, uh, when we speak about severability is that the court will first try to read down a provision which it finds unconstitutional to see if it by reading down, if it can save the provision. Severability comes after the option of reading down is found to be absent. And the third issue, and this one is an issue which has generated quite a bit of controversy, concerns the doctrine of eclipse. Now, this doctrine is largely based on the idea that fundamental rights are prospective in nature. The basic predicament is this, right? If a law is struck down today for breaching a fundamental right, and if that fundamental right is later altered or removed by way of a constitutional amendment, what happens to that law which was declared to be void? Does it revive mechanically or does it have to be reenacted afresh? Assume, for example, a law was struck down for violating Article 19 1F, the right to property. On its removal from the Constitution, would such a law have been mechanically revived? The answer to this question tends to differ depending on whether a law is pre-constitutional in nature or post-constitutional. Because the Constitution, as we know, is retrospective in its operation. But the question is, were fundamental rights also prospective in its operation? I'm sorry, the Constitution, as we know, is not retrospective in operation. We know that it's prospective. But what about the fundamental rights that are contained within it? This question was answered first by the Supreme Court in Keshavan Madhavan, Keshavan Madhava Menon versus State of Bombay, AR 1951, Supreme Court 128. The petitioner in that case was undergoing prosecution under the Indian Press Emergency Powers Act of 1931. The offense concerned a publication of a pamphlet that he had made in 1949. He claimed that this law violated his right to free speech under 191A. But, the fun but fundamental rights the court held applied only prospectively and that at the time when he committed the offense, the law was still a valid one. The court also said that the declaration in Article 13.1 of voidness is prospective 
and it is not tantamount to a virtual repeal of the law. So a declaration of a law being void by virtue of it violating a fundamental right according to the court did not amount to a repeal or you know in the nature of how parliament can repeal a previous statute. So Justice Das said that Article 13 one cannot be read as obliterating the entire operation of inconsistent laws and in a manner to wipe them out altogether from the statute books because it exists for the purposes of all past transactions for enforcing rights and liabilities that have already accrued under it and so forth. Then we go to Bikhaji Narayan Dakras versus State of Madhya Pradesh, which is AR 1955 Supreme Court 781. Here the provision in question allowed for the creation of a government monopoly in private transport business. After the coming into force of the constitution, this provision became void for violating Article 191G. But that provision, Article 19.6, was amended in 1951 to permit state monopoly in business. So the petitioners argued that the statute now, because it had been declared dead, and because it had been declared void, had become dead, and it could only be revived by a subsequent uh, reenactment and it couldn't be amended. The court held that fundamental rights eclipsed a law that was validly enacted <sighs> otherwise. And if that bar is removed, the law will automatically revive. So Justice Chief Justice Das again said that the effect of the First Amendment was effect was to remove the shadow and to make the impugned act in that case free from all blemish and infirmity. Uh, he also said, and this is more in the way of an arbiter, that the doctrine of eclipse in this case applied only to citizens and not non-citizens because non-citizens anyway don't have a right under Article 19. The question is, what about post-constitutional laws? Does the doctrine of eclipse apply to post-constitutional laws as well? Here we have divergent opinions. Before we get into the opinions, we might quickly want to consider what Professor Cooley, the great constitutional law scholar said. He said a statute void for unconstitutionality is dead and cannot be vitalized by a subsequent amendment of the constitution, removing the constitutional <laughs> objection, but must be reenacted. It was this statement of Professor Cooley that the Supreme Court relied on in Sagir Ahmed was a state of UP. AR 1954, Supreme Court 728. 1954, Supreme Court 728. When the court held that the legislation which contravened Article 191 g because it was not protected by Clause 6, would have to necessarily be reenacted and it could not be validated by a subsequent constitutional amendment. This principle was made clear by an opinion of Justice Subarao in Deep Chand was a state of UP, which is AR 1959, Supreme Court 64, where he held that there are clearly differences between 13.1 and 13.2, that insofar as pre-constitutional laws are concerned, the doctrine of eclipse would apply. But for post-constitutional laws, a law that is found to violate any one of the fundamental rights is a nullity right from its inception. This principle was again upheld in Mahendra Lal Jaini versus State of UP, AR 1963, Supreme Court 1019, where the court again said that the doctrine of eclipse applies only to pre-constitutional laws. But there was a slightly divergent view that arose out of Justice Matthew's opinion in State of Gujarat versus Ambika Mills, which is AR 1974, Supreme Court 1300, where he said that the voidness of a statute of even a post-constitutional statute where it violates, say, Article 19 would apply only in so far as it to citizens and not to non-citizens. So he said that the term void, therefore, in Article 13 makes the law only relatively void and not absolutely void. But we'll see that this distinction is really quite facile because the law could still be absolutely void in so far as its application to citizens is concerned and completely alive in so far as it's applicability to non-citizens is concerned. So this can't really be a ground to apply eclipse. And in fact, a full bench of the Delhi High Court through Justice Hardy's opinion in PL Mera versus DL Khanna, AR 1971 Delhi mm -hmm. 1, held explicitly that the doctrine of eclipse will not apply to post-constitutional laws. This judgment has been applied by our High Court, a division bench of our High Court when it uh, in characters, where it uh, struck down uh, amendments made uh, to the uh, Right to Fair Compensation and Transparency in Land Acquisition Act by the Tamil Nadu government. That's pending in the Supreme Court, but that was more in the context of uh, 
uh, repugnancy between state and central legislatures and, and how uh, voidness accrues in that. But uh, this opinion of PL Mehra's has also been sort of, I mean, subsequently the Supreme Court in KK Punacha, who is a state of Karnataka, 2002, 4 SCC 362 has also made it explicitly clear that the doctrine of eclipse will not apply to post-constitutional laws. Uh, the great uh, constitutional scholar uh, H.M. Sirvai in his his sort of historic work argues that Deep Chand is spurring curium because it fails to follow an earlier judgment of the court in Sundaramaiah's case. But uh, Sundaramaiah's case was broadly dealt with a distinction between unconstitutionality on the grounds of lack of legislative competence and unconstitutionality occasioned by other constitutional limitations. It didn't quite deal with fundamental rights. But the court had held there that while in the former case, that is unconstitutionality on grounds of legislative competence, the law was void ab initio. Unconstitutionality on grounds of other constitutional limitations was not a case of uh, the statute being void ab initio, but the law will effectively lie in a state of suspended animation. But broadly, the, the principle today that has emanated out of these judgments, even though there are some divergent views, is that the doctrine of eclipse will not apply to post-constitutional laws insofar as it violates fundamental rights. And that, to me, seems like a sound view. Now, I'll conclude. Before I conclude, I want to touch upon the one final controversy, and this has been a controversy of substantial note, which is the definition of law and whether that definition includes personal law within it. Okay. Now, Chief Justice Kanya, back in his decision in A.K. Gopalan was a state of Madras itself, had held that even in the absence of articles 13, that is articles 13, 1, 13, 2, etc., the court still had the authority to strike down unconstitutional enactments. For example, in the US, there is no similar principle, but in Marbury versus Madison, it was found that that is implicit in the very idea of a guarantee of Bill of Rights. So the entire purport of guaranteeing a set of fundamental rights in Chief Justice Kanya's opinion meant that Article 13 was in many ways a clarificatory provision. But in considering whether personal law is law within Article 13, the landmark judgment is that of the Bombay High Court in uh, State of Bombay versus Narasuapa Mali, which is AR 1952, Bombay 84, where the challenge made was to the Bombay Prevention of Hindu Bigamous Marriages Act of 1946. That act had sought to prevent bigamous marriages among Hindus alone. And the act was challenged as contravening, I mean, of course, Hindus, including six chains, Buddhists, etc. The act was challenged as contravening the fundamental rights of the petitioner under Articles 14, 15, and 25. The petitioner argued that Muslims had been kept out of the statute's reach and that polygamy was commonly practiced amongst Muslims. The court first held that, held that what the legislature had attempted to do through the Hindu Bigamous Marriages Act is to introduce social reform, which was explicitly permitted under Article 25 2B in respect of a particular com uh, community and in respect of its particular com community's personal law. Uh, it also recognized the distinctions in the institution of marriage between Hindus and Muslims in terms of how the, in the former it is a sacrament, while in the case of Muslims, it's a matter of contract and so forth. But what the court effectively said was it's up to the state to decide when and how it wants to bring about social reform. It might choose to do it in stages. It might choose to concentrate on one community first, concentrate on one territory first, and then move on to other communities and so forth. But uh, it was also argued, uh, and at the time thought to be quite ingeniously, that the reason, uh, that is that, uh, but that is by reason of the constitution itself, the Muslim personal law in so far as it permitted polygamy had become void. And because polygamy was void now, the act had discriminated in applying only to Hindus. And it is in response to this point that the Bombay High Court had to consider whether personal law was, was law within 13. Two opinions were rendered, one by Chief Justice Chagla and the other by Justice Gajendra Gatka. They again take divergent approaches, but they conclude, both of them conclude that personal law is not law within 13. Chief Justice Chagla relies on the doctrine of expressio unius exclusio alterius and says that the constitution specifically in the definition of law includes personal uh, includes customs and usages but doesn't include personal law it mentions in article 17 a prohibition of untouchability it guarantees freedom of religion under article 25 so when it does all of that if the intention was to include personal law then it would have been expressly included but this argument it doesn't quite logically add up because one the definition of law under 13 is inclusive in nature 
secondly you can't really make much of it bring about much of a difference between personal law and customs and usages because personal law itself has been shaped and fashioned by the courts which operate under the system of government over the years in terms of by going through various religious texts etc so the and the idea that personal law is therefore not law uh, is somehow I, I think antithetical to even the use of this uh, uh, doctrine of expressio unius exclusio alterius. Gajendra Gatka J broadly says that it will only include statutory law. It will not that it law has for for a law to have force, it must be statutory law. But again, this doesn't add up because it's not as if personal law was not having force. It was being enforced by the courts of our country. So it certainly would be a law which is has the force of law in terms of carrying sanctions, etc. Now, very recently in Sharaya Bano's case, the question came up on whether triple talaq was unconstitutional or not. The first question that the court had to answer there, the constitution bench had to answer there, was whether the 1937 Muslim Personal Law Shariat Application Act, in fact, codified triple talaq. And the way in which the court answered this question has bears quite a bit of significance. Because two judges, speaking through Justice Nariman's opinion, Justices Nariman and Lalit, Held that the triple held that triple talaq was in fact codified under this 1937. But all the other three judges, through two opinions of Justice Kurian Joseph and Justice Kehar, speaking for himself and Justice Nazir, said that the 1937 Act did, did not codify triple talaq. So for Justices Nariman and Lalit, it was easy enough to strike down triple talaq. They said that because it is codified under the 1937 Act and because it is manifestly arbitrary, it violates Article 14. And they didn't get into answering the question of whether personal law was law within 13 at all. Justice Kurian Joseph and just Justice Kurian Joseph said, no, it's not codified under the 1937 Act, but it's still not an essential part of Islam. And therefore, it doesn't uh, get any protection under Article 25. And there's no question of applying it at all. Justice Kehar and Justice Nazir said that it is personal law and personal law is beyond the uh, scope of judicial review under Article 32 because it's not law under 13. And therefore, the court cannot look into it. It's up to the legislature to bring about social reform. So what we had effectively are three judges agreeing on the outcome that triple talaq is either invalid or is inapplicable. And two judges saying that it's personal law and, and cannot be looked into at all. So we therefore now have a situation where there is no real authoritative pronouncement from the Supreme Court on whether personal law is law or not under Article 13. Uh, so that's a question that's still up for debate and uh, perhaps when the court uh, looks at other questions. So there are still challenges pending to the practice of polygamy, etc. When it hears those challenges, it might be able to overrule or rather reverse or overrule the proposition which was framed in Narasuapa Mali's case, which is that personal law is not law under Article 13 and hold that it is law and that it is amenable to the various fundamental rights guaranteed under Part 3. And thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, so, hey, to be frank with you, one hour and eight minutes is something very scintillating. I would, I would rather say the flow and the coherence and the cogency in your lecture is something very amazing. And I should salute for the excellent lecture you have given. And thank you for the uh, brilliant session. I have the first question to you, if you don't mind. Sure. Thank you. See, when you come to Article 12, uh, we are still in quandary as to which kind of uh, yardstick can be followed. To. Can we now say that Article 12, the definition of Article 12 is fully settled? Are still under uh, being expanded every day by the courts? Uh, no, sir. It's, not, it's definitely not fully settled, but it is settled to the extent that the tests now, I think, are governed by the uh, test which was framed by the seven judge bench in uh, Pradeep Kumar Biswas's case, which is one of functional, financial, and administrative control. So we have a scenario where the court, courts simply do not look into what the function of the organization itself is. So tomorrow, let's assume that the defense of India is completely privatized. I'm just taking a, exactly. a wild uh, example. But if that's not under the control of the government at all, let's assume that there is no financial, functional or administrative control that is exercised through a statute, but it is completely privatized. Let's say then what happens is that as per the test today, it would not be state under Article 12. So we need the test, I think, in my opinion, to also take a functionality approach into account where if an organization performs a function regardless of the control that the government might exercise over it, which is so critically public in nature, 
then it must uh, necessarily be considered state because I think that's somewhat the intention of the framers also. If we look at uh, what Ambedkar said uh, during the constituent assembly debates, we'll see that the idea was always to have for these other authorities to be interpreted as widely as possible. I have one doubt, Mr. Sugreen. I yeah. come to know that uh, the U.S. Um, I think Constitution follows what is called a state action formula. I think you might have heard about it, where it speaks that uh, um, the principle behind the doctrine of state action means state aid, control, and regulation so impregnating a private activity so as to give it the color of a state action. Yeah. Can that state action theory be applicable? In the scenario which you contemplate in the matter of privatization of uh, even the sovereign functions of the state? Yes, sir. I think potentially yes, because uh, yeah. that's effectively what uh, Justice Matthew was hinting at uh, in uh, his concurring opinion in Subtev Singh's case, and also what Justice Bhagwati was effectively mentioning in Ajay Hasya and in R.T. Shetty. But for some reason, it's never gone into the actual analysis. In the BCCI's case, I it, it directly came up before the court. I mean, the court could have still said BCCI is not state because these functions are not necessarily sovereign in nature or mm -hmm. they don't perform public duty. That is public. a matter of factual uh, distinction. But as a matter of legal doctrine, I think that's where they went uh, amiss. And, and that comes out very clearly in the dissenting judgment of uh, Justice S.B. Sinha in uh, Z Telephones. But unfortunately, I find that the state action uh, formula is not accepted by the Indian Supreme Court in MC Mehta's case, I think. Uh, MC Beta was Union of India, 87 yeah. Supreme Court. Yeah. So this is the time for us to evolve for a new form. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. CBS Kirija? Yes, uh, Suhrit. Yes, sir. Please hear me. Yes. Uh, the lecture was wonderful. I just have uh, two comments. One is, uh, I was surprised that you left out the uh, Andy Muksa trust case and Janet J. Paul case, where the Supreme Court distinguished between the expression other persons or authorities in Article 12 and the and in Article 226 and declared that the expression other persons and authorities in Article 226 is wider than the that expression in Article 12 for enforcement of uh, uh, mandamus and declared that as far as mandamus is concerned, it is only the nature of the duty that is uh, relevant and not the duty of the not the uh, what do you say nature of the body where a, a mandamus was issued to a private trust. And second is Janet J. Paul's case. I think it is 2016, if I remember right. I don't have the citation with me. It was SRM University where the Supreme Court uh, held. In fact, I argued that in the High Court. It was uh, the Supreme Court held that a deemed university is a state within the meaning of section Article 12 of the Constitution. And for that purpose, went into the history of writ jurisdiction and the interpretation of the uh, Article 12 and yeah. uh, issued a mandamus to the deemed university. Yes, sir. Uh, that is all. Uh, that is my yeah, point. I mean, the, uh, actually, the, yeah, the reason why I didn't get into uh, that was because it was more on 226. Uh, but uh, uh, I mean, you're entirely right in saying that the uh, scope of the meaning authorities in 226 is much wider than in 12. The problem, of course, is not for authorities such as SRM University, which will be regarded as state, because authorities which are regarded as state will still have to be authorities under Article 12. The problem right. is with purely private bodies that perform public functions. Right, yeah. Now, purely pub private bodies that perform public functions are not necessarily amenable to Article 14, because Article 14 says the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law. So therefore, the question is, what, what standards do you hold them accountable to? The, the only standards that you hold them accountable to are either standards that are prescribed through statutory law or, as I was mentioning during the talk, through uh, to common law uh, rights. So if we say that private bodies that perform public functions effectively have a common law duty to act fairly and reasonably, which is, if, which is essentially the... I think the upshot of Justice Mohan's opinion in, Oni, in the Oni Krishnan case. Mm -hmm. Then we have a standard which the high courts can effectively apply under 226. And I think that will solve in many ways the uh, uh, sort of interpretive model that we might get into by if we were to simply say that uh, private bodies are also uh, must also subscribe to Article 14. I, I don't think that's the solution. The solution is to 
located in common law as opposed to in the in part 3 no, but some fundamental rights like article 21 even article 15 etc are enforceable against private individuals absolutely yeah so 15 you can even you that for that you can even file an article 32 writ if your 15 yeah. right is violated by a private individual yeah. you, you have the right even to go to the supreme court directly article but, 17 yes yeah absolutely. any vijay sir yeah uh, sugreet uh, it was it was wonderful it was wonderful and uh, as usual it was so lucid and uh, you really created a lot of interest in many of uh, the persons who are hearing you to to take the interest in the constitution where i find that many are uh, many are sort of uh, uh, not even touching that book for whatever reasons uh, in spite of the fact that uh, that's the mother of all statutes so anyway uh, it was very interesting when you touched upon uh, this uh, uh, repetition against private persons you, you are you are right in saying that when it came to article 14 it become a sort of difficult to, to do it because it's an action of the state when it comes to article 14 but then this uh, as reader was pointing out in fact i had also uh, put in the uh, messages the judgment which reader was referring to with regard to the deemed university, which is the 2016 judgment of the Supreme Court. I put it in the message also. Uh, so basically, when it came to uh, private persons, as you rightly said, the test of maintainability of repetition under 226 was always based on only public duty. It was always based only on public duty. And in fact, uh, that was made very clear by the um, uh, Supreme Court uh, in uh, 2010, 7 MLJ page 479. In fact, uh, there is one in, one interesting judgment of the Supreme Court in 2013, 6 ACC page 452. 2013, 6 ACC page 452, as you must be knowing, where they held that the TCL is not an authority under Article 12. So that's one more interesting chapter. So when it came to uh, private uh, persons or private entity etc i thought always this public function is the one which is uh, uh, being used to, to see whether it can be uh, issued against uh, such a private body or a private institution etc so overall the uh, i thought it was uh, really wonderful it gave a lot of clarity and in fact uh, during this covid time i had an opportunity to write something on uh, the uh, whether the law includes a personal law also. I had that uh, uh, time to write it. As you rightly said, that it requires a, a, an authoritative pronouncement in the future. Uh, and thank you so much for such a lucid uh, uh, talk. I mean, I, I, uh, I agree with you. So that is in the sense that the test broadly, that is uh, now for authorities which are not state within Article 12, the uh, only option when in, in 226 is to see whether the private body against whom a writ is filed is performing a public function or not. Yes. The moment they perform a public function, they would be amenable to uh, the writ jurisdiction under 226. But we still have the larger question of addressing what are the standards which such a private body must subscribe to and must follow. And that mm. I think is possibly the harder conclusion to make in the sense of where do we locate their duty? The d duty when it's clearly prescribed in a statute, it's easy enough to locate. But right. the general duty to act fairly, that has to come from uh, common law. And that duty, as we all know, over the development of administrative law itself is present. Any body that performs a public function has a duty to act uh, fairly and responsibly. For, for instance, in educational institutions, yes. the, at least the, the approach of the Supreme Court seems to be that educational, uh, imparting education by itself is a public duty. Absolutely. So therefore, it becomes easier for the saying, so uh, it can be maintained against such institutions, even if it is in the realm of a private institution. Yes, sir. So therefore, there it becomes more easier. And as you rightly said, that uh, uh, this, uh, uh, even even the, the division bench of our court went to the extent of saying, after following the judgment of the Supreme Court, that an unaided educational institution will come within it, within it yes. where they apply only the test of public function, taking yes. into consideration that what is imparted is education, which falls within the realm of public duty. So, to that extent, there is some clarity, but as you rightly say, that it requires a more authoritative pronouncement with regard to the other things which you pointed out in your Yes.
so that those duties either have to be located in statutory law or in other constitutional provisions outside of uh, article 14 and other part 3 provisions of course there are certain provisions in part 3 which are enforceable against non state actors also but that those might have to be uh, located in common law because what justice mohan says in uni krishnan's case is that even an an educational institution even if it is not state it is still performing a public duty and it has a responsibility to act fairly so where does that responsibility come from that responsibility has to come only from common law uh, and i i got uh, it i got it thank you sir rajini uh, sir uh, thank you very much for a uh, enlightening speech uh, my question is that uh, that the general tendency that judiciary will not in interfere in government's policy matters so often some appeals are dismissed saying that judiciary will not in, will not interfere in policy matters what uh, you you told and that and we are also aware that laws which are violative of fundamental rights uh, can be struck off uh, as invalid policies which are also violative of fundamental rights for recently tasmark uh, opening of tasmark Uh, several other policies that court uh, we hear often saying that we will not interfere in policy matters when a policy is violative of article 21 uh, 14 uh, is it the duty of the court to interfere uh, in the policy or just uh, um, uh, washing away our hands saying that uh, we will not interfere in policy matters i find this distinction between policy and uh, law to not to virtually be non existent in most cases because uh, it's a matter of standard of judicial review now how is a policy expressed a policy if it is expressed through an order through a notification through a bylaw rule regulation or through a statute it would naturally be law under article 13 so if it is law under article 13 and if it violates a fundamental right it necessarily has to be declared void the question of what is a policy really arises when the supreme court in looking into a legislation for example and it's testing it on whether it violates fundamental rights it sees that the legislature has looked into various different considerations and chosen one option over another let us say now what why the legislature might have chosen one option over another might be a case of it taking a policy now unless that option violates a fundamental right it cannot be struck down so i i i generally think that courts should shy away from thinking in these lines of policy versus law because anything which is a law is amenable to fundamental right so what you have to really see as a matter of first principle is whether something is law under article 13 if it is law under article 13 does it violate any of the fundamental rights or does it violate any other constitutional right and if it does so then it has to be declared void necessarily so this but there are but there are also issues with standard of judicial review the standard of judicial review arises in the sense that if it's a criminal statute for example you know uh, where it leads to incarceration or other such rigorous consequences uh, 
then the standard of judicial review would be much higher. It might be a far stricter scrutiny as opposed to an economic statute or an economic law where the standard might be lower. So it's all a matter of uh, gradations in terms of what standard of judicial review and what amount of freedom is given to the legislature in uh, broadly. Because if you were to strictly scrutinize a statute, something might be struck down. But if you were to apply a different standard, a less strict standard of merely seeing whether a, a classification broadly has been made along rational lines, etc., then a statute might not be struck down. So you, have, so you have different standards for different kinds of statutes. And that, that is fine. That's how it is in most uh, jurisprudences across the world. And uh, that if the courts were not to do that, then you might be taking away from the government's or the parliament's uh, role and responsibility uh, under the general theory of separation of powers. Shall we move to, um, shall we move to Mr. R.V. Ishwar? Yes. No, I, was, I was just, Surat, uh, it was very good hearing you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> as usual. Uh, now, I have a fundamental doubt. Uh, how do you determine whether, it's a fun whether a function is a public function or not? So, uh, broadly, there have been different things that have been said by the Supreme Court on this over the years, even in these judgments that we saw on Article 12. Uh, but what the court at least hinted at would be a broad definition of a public function is any function which would otherwise have been exercised by the government or which we would otherwise expect to be exercised by the government. There are two ways of going about this. One is to look at it independent of the substantive contents of the rights. And the other is to, uh, in a sense, reverse engineer it by looking at the substantive contents of the rights. So if you look at right to equality, for example, that is guaranteed by the state, we might want to see in what circumstances an unequal treatment would effectively constitute a violation of someone's civil rights. So then we look into what are the kind of bodies that are capable of violating these manners of fundamental rights. So reverse engineering is one option that is available. The other would to not look at the substantive rights at all, but merely see whether the body performs a sovereign function, uh, regardless of the, the important thing is to see it regardless of the control that the government exercises over it. So if the government has completely washed its hands off something, but it's still an important public, public duty or function, which would otherwise have been performed by government, then that would be a public function. And this is what uh, Justice Shah uh, hinted at in the concurring opinion in Rajasthan State Electricity Board, which is to say that we should not look at this aspect of whether a body is a creature of a statute or maybe those are relevant uh, considerations. But regardless of all of that, is that body performing a sovereign function, something which we expect from the government? So if I take an example, uh, we, we live in a welfare state. So if we were to say that uh, the provision of rations or the uh, provision of all social welfare mechanism, the government completely washes its hands off it. Then, uh, and it is completely privatized. Then that would be something which is a public function because it is the state's responsibility to, to uh, ensure uh, substantive equality and to provide social welfare mechanisms. Then for uh, the other thing, let's, if we can take more recent examples, let's say, an application is brought about, an internet-based application is brought about for coronavirus testing. Today, the government has introduced an application of that kind. But tomorrow, if that is done purely by private bodies for the purposes of uh, that public health is not affected, then that might also be a sovereign function. So that's the uh, way in which I would think it has to be tested. But we need, definitely need a clear, bright line rule on exactly what would constitute a public function. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Justice Ishwar, sir, for your uh, question. Let's move to uh, Mr. Sri Saran Rangarajan. Hi, Surat. Uh, thanks for the wonderful presentation. Um, I just wanted to pick your brain because this is a fascinating topic as regards Article 12 and 13 is concerned always because uh, uh, one is always fascinated by the impact it has on the special statutes, say, for example, the Companies Act or the Arbitration Act. Mm -hmm. So in specific, my question is, do you think the courts have, like you mentioned, the terminology that you used, have a reverse engineering form them? I mean, having a practice on the private side and now on the government side as a government leader, do you think that the Supreme Court or the courts in general historically in the past and in the present have the target probably in mind the object that they seek to achieve, which may be the Raja good, and then 
although the definition of the term state is fairly well settled right now as you mentioned in the presentation work backwards the reason i say so is in the probably in the context of one example there was a case of kanpur jal sansthan in the context of uh, the arbitration conciliation act where um, the state had argued that order 27 um, rule 8a yeah, uh, if i remember right or rule 9 as regards the other states are concerned where it says that the governments are exempt from making that deposit which is mandatory under section 36 before filing the uh, 34 petition mm -hmm. but uh, the supreme court came down on it strongly and said that that exemption is not available to a government and distinguished the gam the term government from that of the state under article 12 and said that the government is not exempt and therefore also ought to follow the i find a kind, kind of an imbalance where there is a formula which is said you know that if you perform a public function then it is a state but that does not actually translate into when it comes to other statutes or is it the purpose i just wanted to pick it up i i'm actually uh, i mean my, personally i'm quite partial towards the reverse engineering uh, idea the reason being that uh, today we live in a world where there has been extensive uh, privatization of important functions uh, i'll just add to the example that you said i mean you have players like google or you know and and today for example we don't have a data protection legislation right but we have all these various internet based entities which are capable of having serious uh, a serious bearing on our fundamental rights so for example in the first puttaswami case justice sanjay kishan calls opinion recognizes that uh, our rights to pri our right to privacy is also capable of being deeply violated by private entities and in fact that is that he this i idea of big data is a challenge that he says will be of uh, sort of paramount uh, criticality in the days and years to come so if these bodies are have the sort of power over us then it would naturally mean that they are in many ways performing at least to the extent of maintaining this kind of data important public functions so it might well we might well have to think in those terms in terms of making these bodies accountable to fundamental rights which they are capable of violating they might not be capable of violating our uh, you know some let, let's say a right to uh, uh, the rights under 25 or 26 or, or some of the fundamental rights which are ga certainly guaranteed against the state but they might be cap very well capable of violating the right to privacy under 21 even more than the state itself and when you don't have a statute then you're left in a sort of a legal vacuum really the only remedy that you might have is to file a civil suit but uh, which is why i think i'm quite partial to this idea of saying that we must look at the substantive contents and the rights and see who they uh, who is capable of violating these rights i don't i mean of course and also power really comes into it right i mean the entire history of the bill of rights and the history of having this holding the state accountable is emanates out of in a democracy emanates out of this idea of holding people in positions of power accountable and having them be transparent etc now when those people who are in power over us is shifted from the state to private operators such as uh, big internet based private companies then i think that it's a time might well soon come where they too should be held to be state under us sorry uh, i i think i didn't communicate properly yeah. what i meant is yeah so now the position as regards the definition of state is fairly settled so if you perform a public function you keep that particular department or that body accountable so no no, actually, no it's it's not not that way the reason is the test today says there has to be a deep and pervasive control over the body correct so, so mm -hmm. what i meant is i uh, i'll just complete the question what i meant is in a situation like the kanpur jal sansthan's case in 2016 yeah. in the context of arbitration act yeah they said the term government because government was exempt from making any deposit when it goes for an uh, section 34 petition under the arbitration act yeah so they said the term government yeah which clearly in my naked eye would mean that it is a state under as regards article 12 is concerned 
but they differentiated the term government because the governments were exempt under the cpc from right. making the deposit so therefore they said that government is not equal to state yeah. so i just wanted to know i mean the reverse also works so just like when you say you have to make the state accountable where there is public function yeah. but when it hits back do you think the governments the courts are also partial towards yeah. tightening the screws there that's that's what i meant yeah i mean i would agree with you that i don't think that that distinction that distinction doesn't to me seem uh, especially so i haven't read the judgment i'll uh, just read it but no, no, the, the, that was just an example just to yeah. say that whether you know the process is still evolving yeah, i think for, for a purposes of a statutory law if something is considered to be government ordinarily in the ordinary course i would think that that entity would also be state under article 12 unless the definition of government used in a statute is so wide just for the purposes of that statute that it somehow that body doesn't perform state like functions at all otherwise unless that is some sort of extreme case of that kind i would think that in most cases a body that performs a body that is considered to be a, gov- a governmental entity in a particular statute would ordinarily be state under article 12 like i i find it very difficult to think of anything which would be defined as government to also not be state it's uh, it seems very far fetched but the supreme court seems to have uh, met that far fetched case yeah <coughs> thanks sir thanks sir thanks sir yeah uh, shukrit there is a question in the chat box the question reads as follows um, whether a public trust is a state within the meaning of article 12 and if not why when the universities are declared as state and amenable under article 14 why not public trust yeah so the re- a public trust would not by itself be state it would depend mm-hmm. on uh, but you know a public charitable trust like the pm cares fund might be state under article 12 because mm-hmm. there, there there is a possibility that a fund of that kind has deep and pervasive where the government exercises deep and pervasive control over that trust but an ordinary public trust might not be state under article 12 because uh, one you have to meet those criteria that of functional financial and administrative control by the state so the state doesn't exercise that kind of control over a public trust in, in india but uh, a university has broadly been considered to be public trust because uh, we state because the courts have found those in those cases of those specific universities the state exercising deep financial functional and administrative control which is why i, I again think that we need to at least adopt a partial functionality approach where if public trusts perform important public functions which are in the nature of state like functions even if they don't have you know they're not controlled by the state they should still be treated as state under article 12 but today if so facto they would not be treated as state i should thank you for the exuberant session and thank you once again thank, thank you thank you. thank you very much thank you thank you yeah.